Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. They did not tell us that all of that uh, being my own person and I'm independent would lead to separation, loneliness, celibacy, and lesbianism. They didn't tell us that if you give up the man, you're going to take one of these things and it's worse and it will destroy your nation. They didn't give us that information. They made us think that it was some kind of glorified position to brag about the fact that I got my own job, my own credit card, my own car, so I don't need no man. I don't even know how we got that mixed up. Ain't none of that got nothing to do with having being with no man. You know, you know we, we have some serious relationship problems that uh, nobody has been able to address us on because everybody wants to pretend that this is not going on. You know, over 60% of our women are single, widowed, separated, or divorced. They don't have a man. I just came out of Florida and they got a housing complex that the Urban League built, which is a black organization that is for women and children only. They, don't, they say they don't allow any men in there. I didn't have time to deal with it, but I talked about them real bad. That's the silliest program I've ever heard of. You know the women that had men if they got a bunch of children. They need fathers. They need protection. To recruit people into the welfare system, we relax the rules. If a woman had to declare paternity in order to file out the welfare, the ACLU sued and said this is a violation of our privacy rights. They also said that the nuclear family, Izzy and Harriet, was Eurocentric and therefore racist. <laughs> the women's movement concurred with that. The black power movement also agreed. Millions of blacks in a period of less than four years flooded into the welfare system in major cities. At a time when the unemployment rate for blacks in New York for males was less than 4%. If I could get me a job where I could be my own man, they make me think that they're feeling sorry for me. Give me this, give me what I need. This is like a pet, like a dog, you know, like, give him, he, he, you have to be fed now, give him some food. What you then saw as a consequence of separating work from income, the out of wedlock births in the black community began to skyrocket, went from under 25% to 70 percent. The legitimacy rate in the uh, United States among blacks is roughly around 55 percent. That is nationally 55 percent of all black babies are born out of wedlock. And in some cities like New York and Chicago, um, uh, you might find 80 or 90 percent, New York and Washington DC rather. Now, the, the illegitimacy rate among uh, uh, blacks is a new phenomenon in black history in the United States. That is, in 1940, the illegitimacy rate among blacks was about 12%. In 1918, the illegitimacy rate among black teenagers was less than that among white teenagers. So how do you explain the increase in illegitimacy and or out of wedlock marriages or slovenliness in general. Well, I mean, I think any economist, economist would tell you that if you tax something, you're going to get less of it. And if you subsidize something, you're going to get more of it, whether it's wheat, cheese, or slovenly behavior. And indeed, in the United States, we have been subsidizing slovenly behavior. That is, we have been making the cost of illegitimacy or having kids out of wedlock relatively cheap. That is through welfare payments, through other kinds of in-kind uh, uh, payments. And then the fact that the modern times of the 60s uh, there, uh, and the 70s, there's, there was a loss, loss of the uh, ostracism associated with illegitimacy. When I was a young kid, and uh, keep in mind for all of you, I just look very young, but uh, I'm much older than that. But when, when, uh, when, a, when a girl, when a black girl would get pregnant, she was a disgrace to her family. And she was sent down south to live with uh, a relative. 
and uh, because it was just a disgrace. Nowadays, I mean, girls are pregnant and their stomachs, and they're just kind of dancing in the streets, going to school, and and uh, all the uh, the social penalty penalties have been withdrawn from it. So I, I I think that the I think one author put it that the welfare state in the United States did more to destroy the black family than slavery could have ever done. That is, the, uh, slavery and Reconstruction could ever done. That is, blacks were f black families were far more stable during the Reconstruction period. In New York, in, in 1920, in New York, 80% of all black children lived in two-parent families. And nationally, up until uh, 1960, it was 75% of blacks lived in two-parent families. And it was roughly equal, a little bit less than that of whites. Today, the number of blacks living in two-parent families is around 42%. And it's declining. When we hear about the drug problem that we have in our projects across the country, it's one of the major places that we have a drug problem. You know, we talk about the great strength that we have as black women. Well, the uh, welfare department don't rent government apartments to single black men. Those apartments belong to black women who are allowing this to go on in their home. We have not looked at what part of the responsibility do we share. Yes, black men sell a lot of drugs, and a lot of us black women get the money from them drugs and buy some of these fancy clothes we wear, drive around in some of these fancy cars. He is not doing these things alone and without support from us, whether they are good or bad. See, we have a lot of power. We are very strong women. I'm saying that we're using our strength in the wrong direction. We're using it to tear our man down, tear our nation down, instead of building it up. Having an education and a job is not, does not necessarily mean you have a successful life. I keep telling black women that to uh, raise a child, they say, well, I uh, provided with food, clothing, and shelter. That's not raising a child, that's maintaining one. To raise a child, you need a parental coalition of a man and a woman. We have sons who, are, by not having a father in the home, they don't know how to respect women. They take on the uh, black feminine, female emotionism. They're doubtful, they're indecisive, they can't make a decision. They don't know what to do about being a man because we can't teach them that. We don't have that knowledge. We have daughters who grew up in a home where they don't see any affection, where there's no man there. They go out into the world and try to mate. They don't have no idea how to be no woman to no man how to function in a house with a man, because they haven't seen it. Most of our children, just like us, get all the information we have about how you be with a mate off television. It's the only medium that shows us anybody being together. Those rules have not worked for us. The white woman's liberation movement, we don't have anything to do with that. We have not been under the control of the black man for over 500 years, so what do we have to get liberated from them from? Here, let me give you a hint. So I was reading an online article to which I came across something that I didn't know about Gloria. It talks about Gloria's new book, My Life on the Road, recounting her life, journeys, and travels. But look at the bottom paragraph. What is often missed or mischaracterized, however, is the work she did as a CIA agent. Steinem was a spook. Confused, I decided to dig a little deeper. Black feminism, the CIA, and Gloria Steinem. What follows is a fact sheet about Gloria Steinem's operations against the various social and political movements in America, particularly her role in creating a hateful and virulent strain of black feminism that attacks black men while partnering with the white establishment. Steinem first came across the radar of black men when she put a book called Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman by Michelle Wallace on the cover of Miss Magazine, to which she controlled. Let's read on. The book was written by a black feminist and activist, quote unquote, named Michelle Wallace, who came out of nowhere. She was in her early 20s, yet she was being touted as the leader of black feminism. In the book, Wallace called abolitionists like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth ugly and stupid for supporting black men. She called black revolutionaries chauvinist macho pigs and advised black women to go it alone. Go it alone? Do it alone? I don't know. But peep what Gloria said. Gloria Steinem said that Wallace's book would define the future of black relationships, and she pushed hard to make sure the book received massive publicity. Define the future of black relationships? What's the bottom line? The bottom line is the so-called black feminist movement was created and manipulated by the CIA from the very beginning.
the only difference between black revolutionaries and black feminists on this issue is that black revolutionaries know they were infiltrated and manipulated, but black feminists are still unwilling to admit that they were infiltrated and manipulated largely because they are highly invested in the hateful brand of black feminism. It is now a central part of the culture of black women and this fact has led to the destruction of the black revolution and the complete distortion of black relationships and the CIA had a direct hand in creating this situation. So black woman, Gloria Steinem, your American journalist, feminist, political, social political activist, and CIA agent, she was used to cause disunity in the black family through the use of feminism. Remember that book we read earlier, the one on the black myth by Michelle? She said that would be the future for black relationships. Nothing positive in that book was written about the black men. They were putting them down. They haven't been our boss. That's the white woman and her man. They're going through that and that's their business. We don't have any business being in there. They only introduced it to break down the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement started with the black man, the black woman, and the black child standing together, trying to plead for a freedom, justice, and equality, and more benefits in the country that they had had built. They threw the white woman in there with the women's liberation movement and made it a woman against man thing. That created a big separation between black men and black women because then everybody started going for self. Then they bring the welfare system in and tell us in order to feed and clothe and house our children, we have to give up our man. You have to put the man out of the house. When the white farm wife goes to the government for subsidy for the farm, they don't tell her to get rid of the farm and they keep that family together. But in the black community, they make it a requirement because they want to keep endorsing into the black community that the black man is no good.